Hello and welcome everybody. So today we're going to be talking about Mini GPT-4, which is a very sweet application. It's using a couple key pieces of technology that I want to walk you through today. And uh, we can see how it's able to do a pretty fantastic job at describing this image and relaying it back to us in text. So first things first, obviously we can upload an image and then we can kind of make inquiries about that image. So I've asked it to describe the image. It's not exactly correct, but it's definitely close. And given the fact that all of the tools that are being used to power this thing are open source, I think it's pretty incredible. And then you're also able to follow it up with some more questions, which is fantastic. And you know, again, it does a totally fine job. It's not amazing, but it's definitely close enough. So what this paper is claiming is essentially that GPT-4's multimodal capabilities are a product of the advancements made by the large language model itself. So it's less so that the model is multimodal absolutely, and more so that given the correct format inputs, the model can behave in a way that is multimodal when it's ensembled with something that can produce the inputs it needs. So in order to test that hypothesis, the paper writers developed a strategy where they would basically just cobble together a visual encoder and then a pretty advanced large language model. So basically the key tech choices they made was they're using Vicuna, which is a derivative of the Llama uh, findings. And they also use Blip2, uh, which is from a fantastic paper if you haven't uh, seen that. It's definitely worth delving into, uh, which essentially is just a combination of a vision transformer and a cube former. In order to cobble these two things together, though, they added one additional layer, which is this linear projection layer. And that's all that they need to do. That's all they train. That's the only thing in this process that's actually unfrozen is that single linear projection layer. So let's take a look at the model architecture and see kind of what's happening. So I've remade the architecture just to provide a little bit more context. The paper's diagram is fantastic, but I just want to be able to go through the flow and really spell out what's happening here. So first things first, the only layer in this image that isn't frozen is this layer right here. This is frozen and this is frozen. So there's no training happening on anything but that linear projection layer. So let's just kind of, you know, examine how a particular image might flow through this and then how we interact with it through text. The image is encoded by this Q farmer and vision transformer. Then those outputs are passed to our trained linear projection layer where they're added into the prompt as a soft prompt. All right, so what exactly is a soft prompt and how does it help us? Well, we can look to Google's research to help us understand. And essentially what a soft prompt is, is it's a you know collection of fixed length vectors that are fed into the model as input along with the text. Now, critically, these are trainable entities. So we can actually have the prompt or the soft prompt learn how to best guide our model to the desired output. What this means is that the, the soft prompt isn't like a sentence you're going to be able to read or understand, but it is a guiding force for the model to push it towards producing desired outputs when we provide specific inputs. And so it doesn't require any training at all on the base model all you have to train is that soft prompt. And that's very important because it lets us have a more, uh, you know, training based approach to prompt engineering, right? So let's go back to the diagram and look at again, how this helps us. So as you can see, we, we basically turn the image into a soft prompt. So instead of providing the you know, the specific full image description or something that we would need to produce with text or, uh, you know, relying on some kind of additional architecture. 
All we need to do is give the model the soft prompt that's produced by the linear projection layer and then append that to our actual prompt. Now, in this case, we're not getting tacked on at the end. In fact, it's basically provided as context for the input text. So similar to how like you might, if you wanted a question answered, you might provide uh, you know, a lot of context to your model and then ask it to answer a question that you know is somewhere in that text. Uh, this is basically doing the same thing, but we're passing this linear projection layer representation of our image as our soft prompt. And then we're using our, our actual text and then feeding that into the large language model. The large language model is not unfrozen. It's not learning anything. The QFarmer VIT stack is not learning anything. It's just this layer that is learning how to best represent the image in the soft prompt to our LLM. That's a very powerful notion, right? The idea that we don't need to, we don't need to actually make the image understood by the internals of the model. We can, through the prompt tuning process, make the large language model understand and be able to parse data about an image, right? Which is, which is crazy. So let's go back to the paper. And we'll look at their diagram of this, which is, which is, again, it's fantastic. I just wanted to make some things a little bit clearer. Uh, so we have this idea of you can pass in an image, it gets encoded, then that encoding passes through a linear layer, which is, in the case of the training process, learning, and in the case of inference, just providing a soft prompt. And then we get this structure uh, where we provide the uh, linear layer to the large language model as context for our question. And then the large language model can interpret our uh, encoded prompt as well as our query and provide us a fantastic output. So this is all like, it's it's pretty neat, right? Because it's, it's very, simple is definitely not the right word, of course, but like it's very straightforward. Basically what we're doing is we're, we're letting the LLM understand some representation of the image. And it's able to use that to make fairly robust generations about that particular image. So let's go ahead and look at the methodology to see how they actually train this thing. Okay, in the first stage of training, essentially what's going on is they're just passing in, uh, you know, image and text pairs. So the output from the projection layer, so the linear projection layer, is just a soft prompt for the LLM and it is being asked to generate the text included in the text image pair. And that's it. After they did this process, they found that it was the model was very good at doing part of what they wanted, which was, you know, giving a response that made sense or described the image, you know, but it wasn't very good at actually listening to specific instructions about, you know, what to do about the image. And the language was, you know, undesirable, similar to early trains of GPT-3. When you ask it questions or tell it to do tasks, it's not always the best at listening. And so just like OpenAI instruct tuned GPT-3 to give us GPT-3.5, um, the writers of the paper also decided to instruct tune their model. So there was a fine tuning process, which was the second stage, which we'll go into now. First things first, of course, they had to get a better idea of, you know, how to build an instruct tune data set for this particular task, since those aren't just hanging around, right? And what they did is pretty clever. Essentially, they prompted the model to do what was asked. Then they refined that data using Chad GPT in order to ensure correctness and check for certain things that they were, you know, uh, looking for and making sure that the quality of the data was as high as possible. And then they basically just instruct tuned it using the relatively high quality Instructune data set that they had created. And that's it. Uh, my favorite part of the entire uh, paper is definitely this line here um, where they, they did, it took seven minutes to fine tune the model, which is just, I mean, you know, it shows how far we've come. So just like a lot of models, 
there is going to be a problem with hallucination and you know the the model especially as there is some information loss between the visual encoder uh and the language input uh you know you're going to get hallucinations relatively frequently um it's to be expected at this stage of the game this is again built entirely with open source tools uh, so it's not meant to be state of the art. It's just meant to show us potential processes by which we can make even better models. They go into the idea that, you know, the model doesn't have the best perception capacities. Uh, this is again to be expected. They focused on using very lightweight tools. So they could probably just kind of blow everything up as is classic in machine learning and get a better result. But, um, you know, for now, that's uh, just a hypothesis it would take some uh, experimentation to find out what might improve the model's ability to uh, perceive so the rest of the paper is just a bunch of examples um, so I'm gonna quickly show you the github repository where you could actually play with this yourself um, and I definitely recommend it it's relatively lightweight to run you can run it in collab with a premium subscription uh, if you have a larger graphics card at home, you could also use that. Uh, they have a couple different versions of the model. So there's the 7B uh, Vicuna model as well as the 13B Vicuna model. Uh, one of the things I want to really focus in on is this right here. This took, you know, 10 hours on four A100s. And then it took the seven minutes on a single A100. And these are the results we're getting. Right. So with more effort to curate a better data set uh, using architectures that are a bit you know, larger or uh, provide better results in terms of the vision encoding process, as well as the language model, really indicates to me that we're just getting started with this technology. Right. And it's an impressive thing to be able to do. There are lots of different processes that can do this now, but I think this one really sticks out because the quality is fantastic with relatively uh, you know, low barrier to entry. So something like Open Flamingo is definitely great, but it doesn't perform nearly as well as this process does. And one of the most exciting parts for me is that it trains a single layer. That's what's being trained, right? Like. It's, it's incredible to think that all this, all this technology and power we have at our fingertips and we get this good of a result by training one layer because that's how powerful large language models are, right? The idea that these, we, we're not even certain what these large language models are capable of yet and seeing you know new things like this come out is just fantastic. Uh, it's always exciting. Um, you know, I'll ask one more question of the, uh, image that I have, which is going to be, you know, how many spider men are there in this image? So again, while this might not be the craziest, um, you know, at counting, I think it does a really good job. And I want to highlight one more thing from this diagram, which is that you'll notice that once the linear projection layer output is you know, created, there's no need to actually reprocess the image anymore, right? We already have that soft prompt. It's not gonna change between queries. So you actually only need to do that process once, and then you can just start querying that image. So this is, if, if I had to like break this down into one sentence, I would say this is kind of like uh, ask your PDF, but it's encoding an image as opposed to uh, generating like embeddings or passing just plain text from your PDF to the model itself. So really hyped up about this. I think it's pretty cool. I'm very excited to see what people are going to build with this tool. And uh, I hope that you enjoyed this uh, discussion, walking through this new technology. Uh, if you did, please click the like button and subscribe and let me know in the comments, you know, if you want me to change anything or uh, whatever like that. So thanks so much for your time and I hope you have an awesome